Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you spoke and said, let light shine out of darkness, and it was so. O oh Lord, shine in our hearts today to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of yourself in the face of Jesus Christ. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us receptive hearts so that we might walk in the light with Christ and with one another. For your glory we pray. Amen. We're back in Proverbs again this week, so if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4, we will be focusing on verses 10 to 19, so Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 to 19. If you remember from last week, we were considering, and we have been considering, Solomon's words to his sons. But last week, we had a brief cameo from Solomon's father, King David. And so, over this week, we've been meditating on and considering uh, the word that King David had taught Solomon when he was just a young boy, how he discipled Solomon. But in our passage today, I believe we have an allusion to some of King David's last recorded words. Listen to these words there. You can find them in, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and you know, I think you'll hear echoes of these words in our passage today. These are the words of King David. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. I believe we'll hear echoes of these last words of David's through Solomon to his son in the text that we're looking at today. And it's important for us as we consider the book of Proverbs. One of the challenges of Proverbs is that we must consider it in a number of contexts to rightly understand its message and what it means for us. And so, first, we have to consider uh, the covenantal context. It's important to remember that these were words written by Solomon, Israel's king, and here we consider even the echoes of King David's words. So, we remember that these are under the old covenant that God had made with the people of Israel. These were with the nation under the Davidic king. These words were under the old covenant, which promised blessings for obedience, and curses for disobedience. That's one of the contexts that are important to keep in mind as we consider the book of Proverbs. But more than the covenantal context, it's also important for us to fit the book of Proverbs into the narrative context, the, the storyline that spans the Scriptures. So, it's important to realize that even Solomon, King Solomon, failed to live up to his own wise counsel that we'll consider today. He knew what was wise, but he failed to walk in it. And as we consider his sons after him, as we study the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, we see that time and time again, more often than not, his sons failed spectacularly. It's important to keep this in mind as we consider our passage today. 
Now, with that context in mind, it might be tempting for us to approach the book of Proverbs with a certain amount of skepticism, to, to, think, uh, 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 to think of these passages as an impossible standard that no one can really attain, so why bother even trying? You know, to think if, if King Solomon, the wisest, one of the wisest men that ever lived, failed, what hope do I have? What hope do you have? Well, if we keep filling in the, the narrative context, we realize that there is hope. As we zoom out to the storyline of the Scriptures, we realize that God sent a son, one who was born in the line of David, one who was born in the line of Solomon. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Jesus, the light of the world, came to deliver us from the domain and enslavement of darkness and sin and to transfer us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. The Lord Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly. He walked the path of uprightness. He walked always in the light, and He walked in obedience to His Father even obedience to death on a cross where He died in the place of sinners and rebels. But He didn't die only. He rose again on the third day, and He secured not only our salvation, forgiveness of our sins, justification, but He also guarantees and secures our sanctification our growth in holiness and wisdom and walking in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. This good news, this gospel you've heard from the beginning of this service till now, and you'll continue to hear it, that you hear every week, this gospel guarantees that we are counted righteous and that we are able now to walk in increasing righteousness. That's our hope. That's our calling, covenant hope. That's the calling of Christ to all of His followers. So if you're here and this is your first time at covenant hope and you're not a believer or maybe you're considering Christianity, let me encourage you that the first step you need to take in terms of pursuing wisdom is turning from your sin and trusting and committing yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has overcome sin and death. Acknowledge your need for Him. Accept His saving work on the cross in your behalf, and decide to walk in the light of His grace. That's step number one. You can do that today. Apart from that, the rest of this sermon is really powerless to you. Because apart from Christ, we cannot obey these encouragements and commands in Proverbs. But with Christ, we are empowered to obey them. Now, if we are in Christ, we have a choice to walk by wisdom in the light or walk by the flesh in darkness. But the gospel enables the gospel motivates us to walk in the light of wisdom. And that's what we see in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Let me read them for us. Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They're robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble, for they eat the bread of wickedness, and they drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter 
until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness, and they do not know over what they stumble. Our text can be summed up in a sentence. Decide to walk in wisdom's light. Decide to walk in wisdom's light. If you're taking notes, that's the main point of this sermon. You can jot that down. Decide to walk in wisdom's light. Now, our passage, just structurally, it breaks neatly into three parts. The first four verses are about the way of wisdom. The next four verses are about the way of wickedness. And then the last two verses contrast these two ways, these two ways of living. But we'll consider in this sermon just the two ways. You'll have two points. Point number one, the way of growing light, the way of growing light. And we see that in verses 10 through 13, those first four verses, and then verse 18. We'll consider them together. So, this is the way of growing light. The father, throughout this section, has repeatedly been calling his son to follow his instructions and follow the way of wisdom. We've seen this already. He's been motivating the son by promising uh, that doing so will bring blessings. We see that again here. Blessings of of a long life, protection, from stumbling and well-being. We've seen this all before. Here's no exception, but look again at verse 11. I think we see a slight progression here. It's now as if the Father is saying, I've taught you about the way, and I've guided you on the way. I've modeled for you, walking it. But now you have to choose it and walk it for yourself. That's what I see as a kind of a shift here in these verses. And so, let me just make a word to parents for a moment, just a a, a tangent, a little sidebar. It's important for us to recognize the extent of what is our responsibility as parents and what is not our responsibility. So, what we see and what we see modeled here in these opening chapters is that we are responsible to exhort, to teach, to encourage, and to even guide our children into wisdom. But in the end, and especially as our children get older and older, it's up to them to decide for themselves to follow the Lord's way, to walk in wisdom or not. We can't make them wise. We can't force them to choose to walk in wisdom. We can only encourage it, model it, and exhort them to do so. You know, I remember when Charlotte, she's turning three in just a couple of months, I remember when she was learning to walk, and at first she couldn't even stand up, of course. Babies, you guys know babies can't walk from birth. We obviously began by helping her. We began by lifting her up in in our arms, letting her get used to, you know, how babies do this get used to feeling her weight under her and feeling what it felt like to lift herself. As time went on, she got a little stronger, and, and so eventually we, we put her in one of those, do you, you know those flying saucer things with the wheels on it? It's got a little seat which kind of holds most of their weight, and their little legs kind of just, you know, scurry around. They fly around the room. It's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, she had one of those. We bought one of those flying saucer things. You know, eventually, though, obviously, she kind of like started to outgrow that. She started to get stronger. Eventually, she would start pulling herself on the co- up on the coffee table. You have to get those soft things on the edge so she doesn't knock a tooth out or something. She pulls herself up. She scoots along the coffee table. And eventually, she could actually, we could, we could pick her up, and she could like start to take steps across the room from mom to dad and then back. And eventually... Now she's, after the service, going to be running around here like crazy, and you guys can't believe that it was only a few months ago that she was just pulling herself up on the coffee table. It's amazing. 
It's amazing to see the progress that she, she's learning how to walk with these tiny little steps, these tiny little incremental steps. Day by day, at first, it, as you're watching it, you can't really see it. It's imperceptible. But she was getting stronger. Moment by moment, over the course of days and then weeks and then months, she was growing. That's what the Father is encouraging in the Son here in walking the path of wisdom. Wisdom, as we've seen throughout the Proverbs, has been likened to a way, a path to walk on. It's not an ivory tower in which to stay and look down upon others. It's, it's a practical thing. It's something we walk in and grow in day by day as we take steps of faith in wisdom. The late biblical counselor David Paulison wrote in an article, Biblical wisdom doesn't spring fully grown from the head of Zeus. He's, he's making a reference to Athena, the Greek god of wisdom who burst forth from Zeus's head, in case that reference was confusing to you. No, wisdom is born small, and it grows through many trials and missteps by the sustaining grace of God toward the fullness of the mind of Christ. In other words, you don't become noticeably wiser through one sermon, but through a hundred sermons. You don't become discerning through one discipling meeting, but a thousand. You don't become wise in a weekend. You become wise over a lifetime of committed steps, decisions to walk by God's wisdom, to take steps. Now, where do I see this idea of growth in wisdom in the text? I think I see it in a few different ways. First, look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. First, he says, when you walk, your step will not be hampered. And so, here the image of, of walking, it's, in itself, it implies taking steps, right? Forward motion. But then look at the next phrase. If you run, you will not stumble. You've got to learn how to walk before you can run, right? There's progression there. Do you see it? As we go down the path of wisdom, as we take steps in wisdom... We will grow, and eventually, one day we'll be able to run down the path of wisdom. It's hard to believe, like I said, that Charlotte, only a few months ago, could only just walk, and today she runs around like crazy. It's exhausting at times, but it's amazing. It's wonderful. But the clearest place that I think we see this progression, this growing in wisdom, is in that concluding metaphor down in verse 18. So, look down, skip down to verse 18. We see the growing light of day. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. It's like the day from when the, the sunlight first creeps up over the horizon till midday when its light shines on all things. Like the sun rising at dawn, wisdom begins small in our lives. But as we make decisions to keep to the paths of wisdom, it grows brighter and brighter in our lives. It shines forth, and it can be seen more and more clearly. Covenant hope, God's goal is for each one of us to be growing in walking in the light of wisdom so that we might grow up into full maturity in Christ Jesus, as we long for and wait for the day when we will shine bright with the glory of God, when we've seen Christ face to face and we've been made like Him. What a day that will be. God's means of accomplishing that goal are a million tiny, different, seemingly ordinary decisions that you make every single day tiny little decisions to take a step of wisdom in obedience to Christ. Each one is a step along a way, either the way of wisdom or of wickedness. 
It's true for us, but amazingly, it isn't only true that we need to grow in wisdom, it was true for the Lord Jesus Christ too. It's hard to even imagine that at thought, at, that thought at first, but God the Son, the infinite, all-knowing, all-wise one, became man. He condescended to have to grow just like you and I. Isn't that amazing that Jesus went through this process Himself for us? The Gospel of Luke tells us one of the only windows into the childhood of Jesus that we have. It says that Jesus, when He was 12 years old, He went to the temple and He sat among the teachers. The one who had made them went and sat to listen. And it says that He asked them questions in Luke chapter 2, verse 46. Jesus, the righteous Son, listened to and learned wisdom. And so, if you're in here and you're a child, you're never too young to start learning wisdom. The Lord Jesus began even before He was 12, but we have evidence that He was doing it at 12 years old. Don't wait until you're older to grow wise. Begin today. Begin walking in little steps of wisdom in following Jesus. Even Jesus needed to seek wisdom as a man in order to fulfill God's righteous requirements, and He did it. Did you notice the steps that He took to grow? He went to the place where He could learn about the Lord, and He asked questions. It's pretty simple, but incredible. Are you growing in the wisdom of godly inquisitiveness? Do you have a hunger to learn and to grow in knowing God's ways and His Word? Ask questions. Seek answers. Sometimes people think that being a Christian requires blind faith and that asking questions is wrong. That shows a lack of faith. But that's just, that's just not true. That's actually God's Word encourages us to do that. That's how we grow. That's how we grow in wisdom. And listen to how Luke concludes and summarizes Jesus' childhood at the end of Luke 2. He says, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It's astonishing. It just blows my mind. I can at times think that because He was fully God, He didn't have to learn anything. But He also became fully man so that He was just like us in every way, except without sin. God the Son took on a human nature that was finite, that could grow in wisdom, that could grow in favor with God and man, and that's the awesome reality of the incarnation. Jesus came into the world to live the perfect life for us, and one aspect of that was that He pursued wisdom from a young age, and He grew in it, and He walked in it. And do you remember what he said to his disciples? You remember he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so we follow him and we grow in having his light in our lives too. Praise God for Jesus' obedience to the Father, His active obedience to fulfill and to model for us a life lived in pursuit of wisdom. And let us follow His wonderful example and grow in wisdom by devoting ourselves to sound teaching and asking good godly questions. In fact, every week we include questions at the back of the bulletin for you to do just that. You don't even have to formulate the questions. Just read them to one another and discuss them to help one another grow in applying God's Word to your life. Make spiritual growth the top priority of your life. Have a plan. Set some goals for ways that you want to grow and the steps that it will require to get there. That's the path of wisdom. That's where the rubber really meets the road. It's those steps and then walking in them, not just coming up with the plan. It's all well and good to, to write the list of ways that you want to grow spiritually, but that list is really worthless if you don't actually take a step 
or you take one or two steps and then give up and go back. It's like having a great gym membership at a wonderful place that has a personal trainer and it has all the equipment, but you never go there. You guys have done that, right? Hannah and I did that for a while. Gym membership, paying that money every month, but it's useless. Didn't ever go lift a dumbbell. Just wasted our money. As I've been saying, it, wisdom, it takes time. It takes going and lifting those dumbbells, taking a step, plodding on the treadmill of wisdom. You can't measure its growth in minutes. You have to play the long game. It's not flashy. It's built over years by committing yourself each and every day to seeking to make decisions which will honor God with your life. It's just that. It's decisions. Ask yourself, what's my vision for my spiritual life as I grow older? What steps am I going to take to get there? What commitments will help me to strive for that? What guardrails will keep me from turning to the right or to the left away from the path of God's wisdom? Which companions will keep me going when I feel faint and feel like giving up? What aspects, and this one's crucial, what aspects of that gospel that I told you about at the beginning of the sermon will spur me on when I'm tempted to give in and give up? Will it be that the Lord Jesus, He's broken the chains of sin that had power over me? I'm not powerless to fight sin anymore. Would it be that He has walked the path of wisdom through suffering into glory, and now I look to Him and follow as best as I can by the strength that He gives? What weight and sin do I need to cast off as I look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter and finisher of my faith? Is it thinking about the fact that through the Spirit, I've now been born again, and now I'm a new creation? I can walk by the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. Is it the fact that the Spirit now lives in me and bears fruit, including self-control, and He's, He's been poured into me richly in Christ Jesus? Brothers and sisters, Make a decision today and every day to grow in walking by wisdom's light. We've considered the way of growing light. Now let's consider the alternative, the way of deep darkness. That's our second point. We see that in verses 14 to 17, and then the final verse, verse 19. The way of deep darkness. These verses, 14 through 17 and 19, they present the way of deep darkness, and the Father pitches a big, big red sign that says, no entry, stop, don't go down this way. We see the same kind of, of, of progression in, in this way as we did in the, in the way of growing light. We see progression in this path as well. Look at verse 14. The Father says, don't enter the path of the wicked. First step, right? Entry. Then He says, do not walk in the way. He's saying, avoid it at all costs. Don't even start down that path. Don't take strides into sin. Don't continue and don't follow new paths of sin that you haven't tried before. Flee from them. The Father heaps up six commands to say, keep off this path. Why do you think that the dad has to keep warning the son over and over again about staying away from this evil way? Not only here, he, he has, you know, six commands here, but we've seen this already all throughout the first few chapters of Proverbs. Encouragements to stay away from evil and sin. Why does he keep warning his son over and over again to turn away from evil? Well, biblically, the answer is that by nature, each and every one of us, because we are from Adam, have all been born inclined to evil, not to good. 
We're not born neutral. We're born sinners. We're all born with an innate resistance to wisdom's instruction. We're born sinners by nature, and that means that sin comes naturally to us, whereas wisdom comes only supernaturally by the grace of God and His Spirit in the gospel. The Westminster Confession of Faith says it this way. It says, we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite of all good and wholly inclined to all evil. That's how we're born. Or, better yet, the Lord says in Genesis 8 that the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's the, that's the inclination of our hearts. In other words, we're all by nature inclined towards this path. And so we need to set up roadblocks and signs saying, don't go down that way. You remember the song, Come Thou Fount, we sing, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That even as Christians, there's a tendency and a pull and an allure to evil and sin in our lives. It's as if the way of wisdom is an uphill hike takes a lot of effort. It takes commitment. It takes decision. But on the other hand, the way of evil, it's downhill. And with every step, we gain momentum and we plummet. Have you guys ran down a hill? It's kind of hard not to keep yourself, keep yourself on your two feet and not flying down the hill on your face. Once you've taken one or two steps, it's, it's just so easy to keep taking steps as we go downhill. And this is because of the hardening effect of sin. As we entertain sin in our lives, as we choose not to fight it but to give in, it grows more and more in us. And when we indulge in sin, we're feeding the beast of sin that's caged within our flesh. Look at verses 15 and 16. See how the Father warns what will become of us if we fail to fight sin and we turn from the path of deep darkness. Look at those verses. It's it's. It's despicable. Our lives will become so consumed by sin that it becomes our state of calm. It's where we find rest. It's what feeds us and sustains us. It's as one commentator put it, these people being described are evil holics, like alcoholics, but for evil, addicted to evil. And sin has become their sleeping pill. They can't rest without sin and leading others to sin. It's interesting that, once again, the Father talks about sleep. We considered that just a couple weeks ago about how wisdom gives us sweet sleep. But here, their insatiable appetite for evil has stolen their sleep from them. Unless their hunger for harm is fed, They can't rest. What a despicable way to be described. But that's exactly where the son is headed if he doesn't avoid their way. And the wicked aren't content to simply stumble their own way along through life in sin. They grab others as they stumble along and they pull others down with them and cause them to stumble. One really important question that this this reminds us to consider once again is to wrestle with what influence others are having in our lives. Asking ourselves, if the people we spend time with, are they helping you to avoid sin in your life or do they cause you to stumble into sin? Now, this doesn't mean that we go into a holy huddle and we never talk to non-Christians or we don't have non-Christian friends. Of course, we'll have non-Christian colleagues and neighbors, but we should constantly be asking ourselves, what effect is this relationship having on me? Is it causing me to grow or stumble? Jesus has a serious warning for those who cause believers to stumble into sin. This is from Mark chapter 9. He says, it would be better for him 
if a great millstone were hung around his neck and that he were thrown into the depths of the sea. Stumbling is serious. And stumbling is repeated throughout this passage. We saw it in verse 12 where wisdom is has the power to keep you from stumbling. Here we see it in verse 16. And finally, look at the last verse, verse 19. Foolishness and wickedness are likened here to deep darkness. And that metaphor functions in in a couple of ways. First, it symbolizes the the depravity that we've already considered, that sin is is dark. It's, It's evil. And it resides in the hearts of men. But here, it's also connected with the effects of sin in our lives. So, it's related to evil, but it's also, what are the effects of evil in the life of the wicked? That's what darkness kind of symbolizes here. It's that they don't know over what they stumble. So, sin actually has an effect of, not only is it it present in our lives and it's dark, but it it causes us to fall even more. We don't even know what we're stumbling over, like walking around in the dark in a room that you've not been in very much and you don't know where the furniture is and you trip over the coffee table. The wicked cause others to stumble, but they themselves are also stumbling around because they can't see where they're going. They can't see what they're doing. And sin has this effect in our lives, all of us, each one of us here. It darkens the eyes of our hearts, and it keeps us from seeing straight. But it's it's very concerning because unlike physical blindness, which is clear to all, especially the person who suffers from it, spiritually blind people don't even think of themselves as being blind. No, they think that they have excellent vision, and so they keep going stumbling into sin again and again, and they don't know why. Why is this happening? I can see clearly when really they're blind. Spiritual blindness, it's deceptive. It makes us think that we're wise when we're really oftentimes fools. It makes good look evil. It makes evil look good. It makes us think that we're walking well when we're stumbling from one pit of sin into the other. And this is why we need one another. That's why part of God's design is that we would be covenanted together in local churches where we would look after one another, where we would care for one another. Earlier in our service, we read from 1 John. Turn with me in your bulletins back there for just a moment. I'm going to summarize it a little bit, but I want you to see this in the text. John is summarizing his message, his gospel message that he's received. He says that, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. God is pure and holy. There's no evil in God, no sin in God. Those who have fellowship with God will avoid the paths of deep darkness. They'll walk in the light with Christ, and that will inevitably be in fellowship with others brothers and sisters. They are inseparable. Fellowship with Christ and fellowship with Christ's body, the church. We walk together in the light, and we keep one another from stumbling into the paths of wickedness and into deep darkness. John goes on to say that walking in the light involves confessing our sins, knowing that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or as Paul explained in Ephesians 5 that we read earlier in our service as well, rather than hiding sin in the dark, we expose it to the light. And then we learn to walk carefully in wisdom. And so let me encourage you, Covenant Hope Church, to make it a habit to confess sin with one another. Confess sin regularly. Make it a plan with your spouse with your friends, with your colleagues, not, not your colleagues, sorry, with your, <laughs> your housemates. It would be weird if you went to work and were like, hey, I need to confess something to you. <laughs> but con- confess it with your, your housemates, confess it with church, fellow church members. You don't have to do this with everyone, but find a few trusted friends to confess your sins to. 
And you know what? As you draw, as you drag sin from being in the dark into the light, it loses its power as you allow gospel light to shine on it. So make it a habit to confess your sins. But also, more than even confessing your sins, let me encourage you to take that one step further. Be ready, be willing to have others point out sin in your life that you can't even see, that you can't confess because you're not aware of it, because you've been blind to it. You don't see it in the dark. Be humble to receive such correction. Don't put up a defense. Invite others to speak into your life and ask them if you can speak into their lives too. If you've never had someone do this, if you've never confessed your sins to others, if you've never had someone kind of say like, hey, Mark, I want to talk to you about something that I noticed. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. It's going to be awkward. But the gospel grace is that we're all sinners and that there's forgiveness for sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. It will be uncomfortable at first, but we're all sinners. We all need help to see at times when we can't see. We need the help of brothers and sisters to call us to walk in the light. We need others, just like the Father in this text, who warns us about the dangers of sin and calls us to turn away from that, avoid it, come back, don't go down that path. As Paul puts it, if someone's caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. You should encourage them to come back into the light with gentleness and grace. This is what we have covenanted to do for one another in our church. That's what it means to be a part of Covenant Hope Church, is to watch over one another's lives. We, we say that we will help one another live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly passions remembering that we bear the name of Christ, and we now have a special obligation to live a new and holy life in the light. Well, I, as I draw this sermon to a close, I want to remind you of the last words of David that we considered right at the beginning of the sermon. Do you remember? About the king The king who rules in righteousness. The king who is like the light of dawn shining forth on a cloudless morning. And, and in his light, life grows. Jesus is that king. Let's grow in the radiance of his light. Let's let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works, they'll see us walking in the light of God's wisdom, and they'll give glory to our Father who is in heaven. So the Father's laid out two ways to live here, the way of growing light or the way of deep darkness. Christ came so that we would walk as children of the light and discern what is pleasing to the Lord. He came to free us from the unfruitful works of darkness and to instead expose them. And so, Covenant Hope Church, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time, for the days are evil. Commit yourself to growing in Christ. Decide to walk in wisdom's light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you glory. You are the God of light, and in you there is no darkness at all. And yet you love sinners who were lost and trapped in darkness. You sent Jesus to be our light, to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to lay down his life for us to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven. And He rose again so that we could be raised to newness of life too. Oh Lord, would You help us to follow Him? Would You help us to walk increasingly in the light? Would You mark our church by a growth in wisdom and righteousness and holiness for the glory of Your great name? 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We celebrate this work that Christ has done for us in our 